Hello. The worlds of Warhammer are brought to life in a great many ways. Ranking highly amongst them are the stories and the miniatures. But for some, the most inspiring and immersive aspect of the games is the art. My guest today has had a tremendous impact on the way that we have seen the Warhammer and 40k universes since the 90s, and he's responsible for countless illustrations that we would recognise instantly. Amongst an impressive portfolio are the covers to the Circle of Blood campaign pack and Manor Wars expansion Plague Fleet, the Dark Angels interrogator chaplain, and perhaps my personal favourite, his Terminators vs the Gene Stealer Magus. We talk about working at Games Workshop, the process and pleasure of creating Warhammer art, and the inspirations that have continued to influence his later career at Sony and Blizzard. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Mark Gibbons. Mark, thank you for joining me. I wondered if we might start by taking a little look at your journey to joining Games Workshop in the first place. How did you come to work there? Oh, well, pleasure to be here, uh, first off. Um, well, uh, uh, made a nuisance of myself, ultimately, with John Blanche. Uh, I had flirted briefly with a career as a miniature painter, but um, uh, it was about 18 months of just sending John work unfit for publication that he eventually turned around i think just to just to get me to shut up they said all, okay, all right all right you can do a couple of pieces i was trying to remember the other day what it, what it was i started off with i know i did a couple of um uh uh pencil illustrations for advanced hero quest which i think were for a white dwarf article but the first proper uh work was for the deathwing and, and uh, gene stealer su uh, supplements for space hulk I had been, I was, I was from, so Games Workshop in Nottingham. I was in my hometown of Cardiff, uh, trying to, trying to break into the music industry, playing in a, in a, in a band. So the work, my work as an artist was very much just to pay for like rehearsal studios and guitar strings. Um, and now I, I managed to break my arm, my, my, my business arm, arm wrestling, a, prof a professional arm wrestler, which was a, you might think was a stupid thing to do, but it, it, it happened. Um, and I spent three months in plaster, not being able to play bass or um, or draw. Um, and it was that th those three months of isolation, I think, that made me realise what I missed the most was being an artist. So as soon as I was out of plaster and unable to, to work again, I got onto Games Workshop and said, you know, you wanted me to come up and start in the studio. Well, I think I'd like to now. And that was uh, early 1992. Right. Um, so I'd done, I'd say I'd done a bit of freelance for them. So I'd been up to the studio when they were still at Enfield Chambers and, and, and seen the mayhem of that location. But by the time I joined them, they were, they were relocated to Castle Boulevard, which was a, uh, just a wonderful uh, place to work, um, and entered what I, I guess I would call their um, silver age for, <laughs> for artists. All the golden, well, not all the golden age artists, some of the golden age artists like Paul Bonner and Adrian Smith had left. And I, I, I did wonder briefly if the only reason I got hired was because those guys weren't there anymore. Um, um, no, I'm sure that's not the case. Uh, so, yeah, and it was in at the deep end, really, at that point. I, I had dropped out of art college after two weeks of painting with custard and gravy using twigs instead of brushes because I thought, this is not this is not how Frank Rosetta did it. <laughs> um, so my, my time at workshop w was very much, a, I think, a, an apprenticeship to be surrounded by... Um, still amazing people like, of course, John Blanche and Wayne England, and Dave Gallagher and Jez Goodwin um, was just, yeah, I was just a sponge absorbing all the, everything I could from those, from those folk. Great. And were those, would you class them as your sort of artist uh, sort of inspirations and the kind of influences that w were driving the development of your art at that time? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, John and Jez uh, uh, in particular, um, I think like a lot of artists of, of, of who sort of kids in the seventies, you know, it's, it is people, it's comic book artists. I mean, for me, um, uh, um, there was no, there was no um, comic book shops as such, but we had these um, little sort of antique markets that would open on, on like a Saturday. And there was inevitably a comic book stall in, in these where you go and buy American comics and stuff like and back issues. 
And as soon as I saw uh, Savage Sword of Conan, which was a large format black and white Marvel comic, that was it. I was hooked. I mean, I've been reading the Robert E. Howard paperbacks, but as soon as I saw the um, the the big the big John Buscema, Rudy Nebres artwork, I thought, right, this is for me. Um, uh, and Rodney Matthews was a massive influence on me too. Me and Jez talk about uh, we we consider ourselves acolytes of the uh, of the faith of Rodney Matthews, um, who was at the time there was a. a, a he was the, the default poster artist. If, if you were, again, into your prog rock or, or your fantasy, you would have Rodney Matthews posters on your walls. So prior to uh, going to work at Games Workshop, it was artists like that. And I guess the artists I would see in Dungeons and & Dragons and then later Games Workshop publications that really kind of drove my my direction. And I, I was a gamer, so um started off in pre-D&D. My, my little group of friends played um, uh, tabletop war games, Middle Earth war games, and micro, World War II micro tanks. Um, but then as soon as somebody turned up with a copy of Dungeons and Dragons, that basic rule book, one Saturday, and that was it. We were that was it for all of us. <laughs> so it was always my hope to end up working somewhere like Games Workshop. Um, uh, I started off doing uh, uh, illustrations for local television and for like advertising companies and stuff like that, but it, fantasy and sci-fi was what I wanted to do. So anytime I got the chance to do something like that, that was a, a, like a holiday from the, the usual work. Uh, so yeah, so getting to um, getting to Nottingham and working alongside people that I had admired so much was, uh, yeah, a, a, an absolute um, treat and very much shaped uh, my whole career, really. Those, those, what was only, I think, five years, ultimately, I, I was working for them. First time around, anyway, was working close to the Games Workshop where, yeah, yeah, pivotal. Mm. Yeah, and you you mostly say that uh, getting the chance to work on fantasy and sci-fi was a treat. You would then obviously be working on that day in, day out, and you, your yeah. art featured in so many different products that were released by Games Workshop over that period, all of the armies books for Warhammer Fantasy, various codexes and, and lots of the games as well. What what were your sort of favorite projects to work on during that time? Um uh I mean I like the I enjoyed the variety. I think, you know, to jump from uh uh Space Marines one day to Warhammer and Dead the next was always a, a tree. You never got you were never on anything long enough to get fed up of it. Although, although maybe the, doing the fifth edition box cover for 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 uh, one of my fancy battle just because it just took so long, I think by the end of it I was quite sick of it. But uh, generally speaking, no, because you moved about so much, it was it was so good. But I, I I'm drawn towards the dark and the spiky, so certainly um, uh, the undead and the skaven and chaos were were probably my uh, my favorite. Although that being said, of the original art, I still have in my keeping. Bunch of high elves and Eldar, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my favourite. So I've still got some of those. So they must have resonated with me. I think that's because I was working from Jez Goodwin sculpts and concepts. I think that was that's kind of why I, I like them so much now because the ideas weren't really mine. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a, an interesting point there, just about working from sculpts and things like that. So, d did you get a brief that would be you need to? draw a load of this or that or and match an existing sculpt or were you creating new stuff like whole cloth i mean most cases because i think because of the way the production runs um the miniatures have to be sculpted way ahead of the art they, you know there's a there's a there's a process there's a, certainly if you're even, even back in the days of, of metal figures you you need to have cast enough so by the time the book comes out or you, or you release information about it you've got enough to sell um and that that takes i mean that's like minimum three months back then plastics when they started doing plastics I, i'm not sure what it's like now but you needed like 18 months to get the the molds made and and, and the sprues cast um so inevitably uh when it, at the, the time when it's like oh we need some illustrations for a book it was at the same time as the every metal painters were painting the finished miniatures again for the same thing for the book so there was almost always uh, existing sculpts to base your 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 art from. Um, later on, uh, it became that they became a little bit more uh, um, flexible, or I, I certainly found myself getting roped into the process earlier. So you do an illustration that served as both illustration for a book and the concept for a miniature. That happened 
later. But usually I would have a miniature. Um, I was handed miniatures and say, right, we need an illustration of this. Or you get a concept art, particularly from Jez, and do an illustration based on this concept. When I went back to the studio uh, in the early 2000s, it was as a concept artist, again, because the, the, the sort of the dynamic had changed and because it was uh, um, not entirely plastic, but majority of, of miniatures were, were plastic at that point. And there was such a, a massive leading. It was kind of right. Let's get the concept straight before we go into the uh, sculpting and then the lengthy casting process. Right. And would you, so from a compositional perspective, was it always that we just need, okay, we're going to need this many of just these miniatures just stood there or, you know, sort of looking cool basically, or we need somewhere there's more action or a sort of dynamic battle going on and that, but how were those sort of briefs created? I mean, I think we were always encouraged to, to put our own spin on, on the art, sometimes much to the chagrin of, of, um, of the factory who, who just wanted art that looked like the toy soldiers. And I mean, I did a lot of that. I did almost to fault sometimes. I look at some of my uh, artwork, particularly the early stuff, they're like space marines, and I've drawn them with heads way too big and hands too big and weapons too junky because I, I just wanted to draw the miniatures because I, I was a big fan. I was a miniature painter, you know. Um, and it was later on I, I sort of scaled them a little bit more uh, accurately. Um, but it would be it would be things like, well, this we need a quarter page um, illustration of this character or this um, this uh, um, trooper. Uh, so you knew rough proportions that, you know, and you would usually uh, uh, paint like a vignette uh, unless you knew it was going to be a full page. And then you you would do a sort of set set proportions. But usually you do a little vignette with a bit of background detail that kind of faded off in one direction or the other. So they could, you know, just so that the art you created was as useful to mm -hmm. when it came to reproduction as, as possible. Um, but it was just, yeah, we need all the troops illustrated we need some heroes you know and, and yeah we could do a battle shot okay sure i mean john would always do the, like a big full page army shot and that would be the template that you'd, you'd find yourself using you know because there's so much detail in it you'd, you'd like pluck a character out of one of those you know, right i'm going to do a, a call out of that character and you sit and you draw them or you'd find out that oh um oh okay wayne's doing the the regular chaos dwarf troop okay i'll do the guys on the rocket launcher you, you know it's that that kind of it was very Oh, we'll find a use for it. And if t if you end up, you end up drawing the same thing that somebody else drew, it's like it's fine. We've got space in the book. You know, it was very kind of like ah, whatever you want to do, really. As long as we got all the bases covered, you know. Yeah, I mean, was it quite tight deadlines then, or were you working to sort of relatively generous time period? Um, I don't ever recall it it being uh, um, uh, panicked. I, I I always seem to remember there was there was time. Um, although, you know, I wasn't at the, at the cutting edge of all that, though. I mean, I did when I was at the studio, I was sat across from the White Dwarf team, which was in a constant state of panic because it never had enough time to get the, the monthly magazine out. So it was always ah, ah, running around. And I never felt that. But maybe it was going on, but, you know, in, in the print printing department of a particular book I was working on. Um, uh, but it, it, it never seemed to be uh, uh, that frantic. Um, once in a while, there's a, I remember there was a couple of, well, one book I can think of that I worked on um, where artwork wasn't used because they found out they didn't have the space for it. And that was a Dark Elf book. There's a couple of pieces I did for the Dark Elf book that didn't, they didn't make the cut um, because the, they reorganized the, the book sort of the 11th hour. Um, and that, that was very rare. That, I, I, again, I, I think that only happened once. Everything else was like, yeah, I mean, usually um i you see a piece of your art used at least twice in a book it would be in the in the background section and then in the army list so they they, they could always done with more art you know there was never quite enough to make a, a piece uh, uh every piece different right i mean some of that dark elf art that you did is absolutely iconic just incredible pieces but so is there some that did it turn up elsewhere that that dark elf art then or did it sort of just go well, unused so. in a drawer uh, somewhere um, well uh well one piece i did a, a, a beastmaster with a couple of, of hounds um and i think i've seen that somewhere else it might it might have been like in a third party um world of uh, uh warhammer book maybe but i also did a an assassin um, that actually they didn't use because they changed uh, what they wanted the assassin to look like. Because I did the more ninja-y 
And they said, no, actually, but we want to do your more traditional cloak and dagger. So the, that art didn't get used specifically because it was not what they wanted the miniature had to end up being. So that's, I suppose, an example of one of those occasions where, yeah, the art came first, but because there wasn't concept art, it, I went straight to illustration and they went, yeah, actually, we're not going to, that's not what we're going to make the assassins look like, so we're not going to use that piece. But again, that was very rare that that ever happened. I mean, I did, um, when I think of things like the art I did for the Bretonian book or for some of the art I did for the Wood Elf book, that preceded the miniatures. So the miniatures were based on the, on the illustrations and, that was fine. That worked out well. Stuff like um, uh, the Green Knight and um, uh, um, Morgana Le Fay came before the sculpts. Um, so fortunately, fortunately, they liked the art. So I mean, it's just ended up reflecting, it. and particularly nicely, you know, in the case of like the Green Knight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's a, a tr tremendous design. And, and an amazing miniature, of course, as well. And a fantastic paint job from Mike McVeigh as well, I think, to do all that. All them, all them curly fronds. <laughs> yeah. He must have looked at it and go, oh, Jesus, Gibbons. <laughs> I read somewhere that you had a hand in the creation of the uh, Goblin uh, Squig Hoppers. Is, is that true? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I, well, I'm not sure if I had a hand in it. I was, um, uh, I was sort of advocating for them <laughs> when Rick Priestley had a bit of a... Uh, he, he thought he thought they might be too silly. I think I, I might have done a couple of Goblin and Squig il illustrations at that point, so I had some uh, some clout. Um, and he said, I, I, "I don't think I think got, I think the Squig Hoppers are just too daft." And I said, "No, Rick, no, they're awesome." And that was the, that was the end of it. Look, I'll draw them. Look, look, well, that'd be good. Look, there you go. And he went, "Oh, all right then." So the fact that you can still get Squig Hoppers and they and they now the the the, 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 the little knights. With the lances and stuff, I think is awesome. I love all the uh, yeah. Squid Cop was one of my, but I think my most possibly my most memorable contribution. <laughs> well, thank you very much for advocating for them because oh, they are right. they're awesome. <laughs> so in the studio, then I mean, what was it sort of like in a kind of day to day sort of vibes? I mean, working with obviously lots of phenomenally talented artists in these incredible worlds. What was the kind of feel and, and I guess the culture of of that working environment? Uh, um, it was, it was chaotic and it was, uh, the, um, uh, um, Castle Boulevard studio was, 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 was beautiful. Uh, and it was, it was a two story building, but it was an open gallery. So on the ground floor was, uh, was White Dwarf was the, the, the figure painters, some of the designers. I was down there uh, for my time in the studio and then upstairs on the gallery were, um, more of the designers the rest of the artists and all the sculptors and there was little offices and stuff up there but because it was a gallery and it was open you could sort of shout up and then shout down and there, there was just you could drop sketches down or throw stuff up um and and we were a, a very short walk from the trip to jerusalem which was a favorite pub so you can imagine the perfect environment <laughs> well let's go to the let's go to the pub for lunch and everybody comes back very happy and carries on working uh <laughs> So yeah, it was um um it was kind of amazing, amazing um um creative uh, environment. And the studio at that point was led by uh, uh writers and, and designers and and so it was a, a bohemian, I think it's safe to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the fact there was always a little bit of um uh friendly rivalry between the studio and the factory out at Eastwood. Um uh, you know, they thought they did a, they thought they were the real and, and rightly so. They were the they were they were the workshop. They were the people that made and sold the games that we and we were just. They called the studio the Ivory Tower. You know that, that was very much how they felt about us. I'm not sure it was reciprocal because whenever I went out to the factory, I was always very excited because they give you a like a, sh a shoe box and send you down onto the factory floor where all the bins were with all the miniatures. And just say fill your box and we'll weigh it at the end of you pay pennies. For all the miniatures you could possibly carry 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 out of there, so I loved going out to Eastwood. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, it changed when I went back in the in two thousand four, I think it was, um, when they'd moved to Lenton, and the studio and the factory were the one on the one site, and the management within the studio was largely from the factory and from retail. The the vibe had changed, and there was. Um, I'm loath to call it a resistance, but it felt a little bit like that. Uh, certainly, the, the artists did. Were, there was a quiet resistance 
to some of the edicts that came down from management. We mm. were quite a quiet rebellion, um, which I thought was fine. I think it was it wasn't um, it wasn't hostile. It was just pff, managers trying to tell us what to do, kind of thing. Went that went on a little bit. No m- mentioning no names, but it was most of us. <laughs> sure. I mean, because I guess that was a period that initial time that you were with GW was very much the the sort of the beginning of the modern era, I suppose, of right. Games Workshop and the creation of all the, you know, the, the Warhammer's, some of its most successful editions and, and things like that. And then that move to Lenton yeah. sort of changed the company, I'm guessing. And you were feeling yeah, that well, on the was, inside. Yeah, I mean, it was even when I went there in 92, it was post-Ansel, you know. Right. Um, so the, the it was changing. It was becoming more... Uh, uh, I mean, corporate is a is a dirty word, but just more, I guess, professional, less of a cottage industry. You know, we weren't making um, Rama Chaos books or all those amazing Orc books that Brian was determined to put out. It was a bit like, no, no, we've got to do stuff for the, that's right for the business. So there was a bit of a sea change then. And I think when I went back, it, it, that, that change was largely complete. Mm-hmm. Um, for good and for and for bad, but I mean, for good for the certainly for the for the business. And ultimately, for the players, I think it was probably it's something that had to happen. You know, for the business to grow. For the, for the, what it's like now, I couldn't begin to guess. Now it's this behemoth. Mm. What what daily life is like at the studio, I've not a clue. <laughs> sure. I still have friends there, and I see every, every time I go back to the UK, I try and get up to Nottingham and hang out. But um, uh, it's been a few years now, so I hope they're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I mean, when you were there, I mean, either sort of period that you spent w- with the company, were there ever any sort of mandates around techniques and and what you had to use in order to create your art, or were artists allowed to use whatever was sort of their style, their equipment, their approach? Um, oh yeah, I'm sure if I said I must use custard and gravy like I did in art college, they would not have had a problem with that. <laughs> No, it was, I mean, it was really down to the individual artist, whatever worked for you. Um, I mean, my techniques changed uh, over time a little bit because I, I, what I wanted, I wanted the art I delivered to be as uh, 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 free from problems as possible. So re- initially my work was all pencil um, and I was chatting with a photographer because of course you had to physically photograph it and then paste that photograph into a, into a you know physical book to send to the printers. Um, and I was chatting to the photographer and he said, oh, man, the pencil is sometimes really difficult to, to photograph because it'd be lots and lots of scratchy, scratchy, scratchy. And the graphite was reflective. So you'd end up it'd end up having to have difficulties lighting the art. So it reproduced well. Um, and I was like, oh, OK, what can I what can I do to, to improve that? And I was always, I would always say, oh, can you make the print a bit darker because it's, it's looking a little washed out? But that's what they have to do to make to make it reproducible. So I switched to Indian ink, which of course has its, has, is every bit as shiny on a bad day as pencil because it's made with dead crushed up beetles, shiny beetles. So that didn't help. So I'd end up putting down Indian ink and then I'd go over that with a pencil to try and matte it and it gets shiny again. Um, and then I've ultimately discovered a uh, liquid acrylic, which was a, a, a flatter finish. So I, my technique shifted over time, but it was always just whatever whatever you want to use. Um, we had a um, there was a local art shop that we would just either troop up to and, and buy all the supplies we needed and bill them to the company, or we'd just uh, um, phone in orders in the pre-internet days where you actually had to. Um, uh, it was just like yeah, whatever you need to do the job. I <laughs> I remember once Wayne Inkland. Uh, Wayne England bought a load of brushes and he hadn't realized at the time, I don't think one of the brushes he, he'd ordered cost 120 quid. Um, and it became this, none of us dare use it. It became this sort of sacred brush. <laughs> there, there you're going to use the 120 quid brush. Shh, shh, I don't think they know how much it costs. Um, but no, it was very much whatever, whatever you need. I mean, the, the, um, uh, most of us were, well, we were all, uh, um, again, pre-digital. So we were all pencils and paint and ink and stuff like that. Um, and it was just, uh, Dave Gallagher was the big airbrush guy when it came to laying laying down his, his, his beautiful background and all his paintings. But Wayne and I would be there scribbling away with pencil and ink. Um, uh, and John, of course, was, John, well, John was whatever work, mixed media, you know, pencils one day, paints the next, inks, inks the next. So yeah, it was it, whatever, whatever got the job done. Yeah. Um, did that stay the same as well when you returned? 
Um, I, well, I went back as a concept artist, uh, and I was still uh, uh, doing stuff in pencil. But I, I was I was moving into digital because I'd been I'd spent a few years at at Sony, uh, where they insisted I learn Photoshop. I, I was very reluctant initially, but they sent me on this course, and I realized, oh yeah, this is really handy and it's really quick to change stuff. So I'm going to embrace it. So the first il- illustrations I did when I went back to workshop were again digital. I don't think they were great. I don't think they were particularly. I hadn't mastered um, the software at that point, so they 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 all I, for me they look a bit a bit shiny and a bit plastic. Shiny again, they look a bit plastic. They they haven't got that grit that that I got from pencil and ink. Um, I have eventually, eventually I think I I kind of mastered it, but um, it took it it took a while. So. Uh, when I went back, yeah, most of the artists were still uh, people like uh, uh, Karl Kapinski and, and Paul Dainton were. Well, they were oil paints. They were proper painters. You know, they were the smell <laughs> of Lindsay Law wafting around the studio was a delight. Um, <laughs> I was in pencil, but then finishing off my stuff um, digitally. Again, so yeah, it's, it's it was again very much um, whatever you whatever you want. I know now the studio, or even you know towards the end of my time there, like two thousand and five, two thousand and six. They were moving digital because it was uh, faster and it was convenient and it was easy to adapt the art. So I know that ultimately even even um, Paul Dainton went to well, did digital. Although you you couldn't tell you look at his art from then, and it still feels like a a, a proper oil painting. You know he, he he worked out what brushes he needed to use to to keep that to keep his style very much his own. Hmm. Was there ever any sort of uh... I guess healthy rivalry amongst amongst the illustrators and the artists, like who could get the most pieces into a given book, or who could do the best version of a specific character, or, or was it not quite that kind of vibe? No, no, I don't think so. No, it was very, it was very supportive, um, and we all had little pet. Just going, certainly going back to the nineties, we all had little pet projects that we that we were encouraged to um, uh, to indulge in, and um, we're very, very, very supportive in that sense. Um, because well, we all wanted to do covers. I think is like, we all wanted to do big color paintings, just because they're the most fun. And it's, who doesn't want to see their art on the front of a book? Uh, but there was a lot of black and white art that needed doing. Because when I was there, certainly in the early nineties, it was John Blanche, Wayne England, and me doing in, all the internal art. Mostly uh, Dave Gallagher did a couple, but he was mainly covers. And then we had freelancers like Jeff Taylor also doing covers. But the internal art, um. Uh, in, in terms of creating new stuff, we obviously had work from uh, Paul Bonner and Adrian Smith and 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 um, uh, Kev Walker and Steve Tappen to to draw on to 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 fill books with. But in terms of creating new art, there was just three of us, so you know we weren't getting to do color pieces and covers as part of a part of the day to day. So certainly, most of my color art, uh, I think most of Wayne's color art was done as freelance pieces in our spare time. So you spend all day painting in space wings and then you go home and you, or to, you know, do black and white illustrations of space wings. You go home and you do your color space green. <laughs> uh, uh, so they were, they were sort of private commissions. Um, and they, it was all, and they tended to be what we wanted to paint. Cause obviously if you're going to give up your evenings and your weekends, it would better be something you want to, you want to do. So things like the, um, uh, the orc codex cover that I did, or the uh, Chaos uh, World Eater Terminator that I did was things like, oh, I'd like to do a picture of this. Uh, and then the Games Workshop were like, oh, okay, well, well, we'll find a use for it. We'll put it on something. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. I mean, what you mentioned there that you had, uh, or most people had their own sort of like pet projects or projects they were super passionate about. Were there any other specific ones that you were really into and really wanted to make work? <clears throat> Yeah, well, I said I want to do some undead. Uh, so I, I said so that ended up being the cover for Circle of Blood, just because I want to paint some again. Because I said I like I like the undead. The only I suppose I should have done I should have said I like Skaven as well, and I could have done big color Skaven painting because I never did never did one of those. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, I can't I'm trying to think of anything else that I was that I that any big color pieces that I did that I that were not. Um, uh, specifically commissioned when i started at the studio actually I, they, I did get a couple of color pieces to do in 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 my day um i did the cover for plague fleet to the man of war expansion and i did the the board game the board the map 
for um, uh, Battle for Armageddon. Uh, right. And then I, was, I sort of transitioned quite swiftly into now we need you to do lots of black and white stuff now, so <laughs> no no more colour paintings for you. <laughs> oh, um, maybe the Goliath I did for Necromunda, that might have been, I can't remember if that was a freelance piece or a, 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 a part of my day-to-day, I don't remember. But there's not, yeah, there's not, there's not that many color pieces. Oh, oh, Asmodee, the Dark uh, Angels uh, uh, interrogator chaplain. That was a. I want to do a space marine. In, I want to do a scary space marine. I've done the chaos space marine. I want to do the loyal, well, loyal, loyalist Dark Angels. Space marine. <laughs> Which is, yeah, I mean, an incredible piece. I was just thinking back to the the circle of blood that you mentioned there as well. I'm surprised they didn't get you to do a lot more. Uh, covers like that because that's an incredible piece thank you yeah I, um again i think it was just down to uh, the amount of work they needed covered they did i think the, the last color piece that they actually commissioned and said yes we, we're gonna you're gonna do this in your day was the fifth edition of uh warhammer fantasy battle and i said yeah don't give me any more of them it's too much it's, it's just <laughs> takes too long it's, it's exhausting to paint all them little you know build this massive battle team can I just do one guy looking cool? How about that? <laughs> I mean, so you mentioned that you you left Games Workshop and you went to work at Sony and you went to work at, uh, at Blizzard and worked on a number of different IPs there. I mean, what what were they like compared to the work you were doing at, at Workshop? Uh, I mean, different in terms of it was it was all concept art, you know, at places like Blizzard and, and at like um, Riot. Yeah, um, it's the world building part, which I I mean, I suppose I'd, I'd done some of at Workshop, but there was already there was so much stuff that was there to draw on. But I, I suppose in that I, I got a good training in what great IP building and, and world shaping was all about from from people around me. Um, so by the time I got to uh, work on things like World of Warcraft. I had a pretty good grasp on 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 how to do that. Um, I, I mean, obviously, uh, Warcraft leans quite heavily into Warhammer as a as a source of inspiration. You just got to make the shoulder pads bigger, you know, and the swords <laughs> bigger, and the bigger, and the swords bigger, and and it was just more whimsical, you know. But fundamentally, it's uh, it, um, it's still orcs and goblins, and it's still. Uh, mighty heroes and and dreadful monsters, uh, um, and it was it yeah it was very kind of uh, 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 free and and um, uh, um, encouraging. There was lots of saying, "What do you think about this? What do you th-? you'd working not just with artists, you'd working a lot with with designers in the early stages of mapping out a, a location. What do you think? What should this be?" And they would do they would do these little. Um, Top down maps that were just shapes. Oh, okay, we're going to have a village here, and there's going to be a forest there, and there's going to be a river flowing through this, and this will be there'll be a dreadful castle here that we can raid in. And then they would get, and I would take those and I would draw little isometric maps and sketch all the little bits of detail in. And those, and then I'd give them back to the designers and they'd go, oh, this is awesome. We can, we'll just use this then. And they would build the thing out. Um, so that, that that back and forth between art and design was really fun. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, very uh, inclusive, and encouraging in in the whole sort of uh, where where ideas were were uh, could come from and, and how things would develop. Um, yeah. But yeah, fundamentally, it's still it's still about tapping into that those great archetypes of fantasy and science fiction that kind of resonate across whatever kind of game you're playing, whatever or whatever media you're experiencing, whether it's movies or games or uh, you know anything like that. It's all it all touches touches on on that um those uh, uh the great myths of, of historical reference you know mm. yeah I, I just tend to find that tends to be what the res- resonates most with people yes you can do you can go off and do very peculiar very particular very unique uh uh stuff but there's i don't know whether how big an audience that ever finds and certainly when you're working with with the, the, the bigger studios it is kind of a, a it's sort of an un, unwritten rule that you want to make sure that you make stuff that has great appeal you know you can't go too niche as, as much as it is nice to, to to paddle in the in the in the shallower waters to make games that are like oh this is just a little little snapshot of 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 the 41st millennium i'm just going to focus in on this one bit it's you know it's always with it with a sense that this is part of a bigger world you know since so you do necromunda it's that's awesome but remember there are space marines out there too you know mm. yeah 
I mean, is it a different feeling when you're sort of creating art? So that sort of concept art space where you're creating stuff and it's very collaborative and you don't end with a kind of discrete end product, I guess. So if you're, like you say about artists, you know, you like to see the the piece of art on the cover and then you can see that and there's like, a there there is my work and I can sort of see it and touch it and feel it. Whereas if it's all part of a bigger piece of work, a game or a sort of world, it, it, what sort of feeling, how does that differ in terms of your sort of, uh, not quite satisfaction, but your sort of engagement with the end product, I suppose? I, I suppose yeah, it's a different it's a different mindset, but it, it's it's it, the reward is is a little different, but it's still very gratifying to see a, a concept sketch you you've done translate into a three D model and see it running around in a, in a in a world that that animated and talking and stuff. That's that's a whole that's I, I don't I I can't say it's it's better, but it's every bit as good mm. to be part of that kind of. Um, uh, that kind of experience for for people who 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 see it and engage with it it's yeah it's 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 really it's it's you're in there you're in the world then and it's kind of rather than looking at a nice interpretation of it you know it feels it's it's satisfying in a, in a different way but no no less satisfying mm. yeah and then that brought you back to games workshop like you mentioned so you returned on a on a sort of uh, concept uh, doing concept art for GW uh, in the 2000s. What was, was sort of what brought you back to the worlds of Warhammer, I suppose? And and was there still some stuff unfulfilled or was it uh, yeah, <laughs> another thought, reason? Yeah. Uh, this was before I went to Blizzard and things like that. This is when I was at Sony and and um, uh, the game we started making at Sony. I, I was a lead artist at that point and we were, we were making um, uh, the video game of the TV show 24. Um, and although I was the lead artist, I was also the concept artist, and there just wasn't much for me to do. Um, and I'd still been doing bits and pieces for Games Workshop. I was working, um, I was doing uh, art for the trading card games, right. just to keep my hand in. And I was, just, again, still talking with John Blanche, um, and it, it became apparent that I I wasn't particularly going to get a, a, a lot out of staying at Sony at that point. So I said I'm gonna I'm gonna take a bit of a break and I think I'm gonna go back to painting orcs and goblins if that's all right. <laughs> and so anyway, like, well, we're sorry to see you go, but we understand. Uh, and I, I'd gone up to the studio and and uh, they said we'd like we'd like you to come back and work on our key design our key design department um, as a concept artist primarily. I said, well, that sounds fun because I didn't get to do a lot of that back in the day, and I I think I think I'd be good at that. Um, so yeah, it, it seemed like yes, a return to a to a familiar environment, but also in a in a new capacity. So it felt like I was sort of completing the the, the journey a little bit. Um, uh, so yeah, it was fun. It was fun to go to go back there in, in a concept role. Um, although, as I said earlier, the studio had changed quite a bit, um, and it 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 wasn't it wasn't quite as as fun as I remembered it. But it was still it's still an amazing creative place. Um, but the dynamic had changed there. Um, and ultimately I realized that pr I'd probably drawn all the space moons I needed to. <laughs> sure. That's to say. <laughs> I mean, at that point in time, what, what did the role of a concept artist look like for the design studio? So what would have been the sort of day to day and the kind of briefs that you were getting? Well, as I say, I was in the I was in the key design department, which had which had representation from all the various creative uh, teams. So uh, I was Jez Goodwin was on the team. Um, uh, there were uh, Paul Jacob uh, uh, and Roberto, another couple of concept artists. Gav Thorpe was on the team. So we had writers, sculptors, uh, Dave Andrews, who was of course an, an amazing uh, hobbyist, um, was always thinking, okay, color schemes and what sort of scenery you were going to have on the tabletop and stuff. So it was really, really nice to be part of that team because you just sit and you just bang out ideas. So you'd be talking about concepts um, and then the sculpting team would pipe in and say, well, we could do this and this range and we could do that. And Dave Andrews would go, oh, this. And then the writer would go, oh, well, well, this. So it, it was, although the, although the team didn't last um, through no fault of our own, um uh it was yeah it was really it was a really cool little little bunch it was a really cool group because then you go away and you'd interact with the actual teams so the black templar um 
Codex was was one I was I was working on, and Graham McNeil was writing that. So we'd, we'd sit and chat with Graham about some stuff, and he'd give me ideas for um, for characters or for troop types, and I'd go back to key design and go, "Wow, I thought about this, and what about that?" And we put that in the book. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, the studio went through a, a big kind of upheaval after about eighteen months of me being there, because the the Lord of the Rings bubble eventually burst. Uh, Return of the King had come out, um, and Games Workshop saw the the sort of the sale. After a while, the the uh, popularity of battle games in Middle Earth just sort of took a nosedive, and they got very twitchy, and they just made some big cuts around the studio. And they, uh, what seemed madness to me at the time, decided that the key design department was one that needed to needed to take a hit. So that was that was the end of that. Um, and, you know, that's the nature of business sometimes. Uh, but at, at that point, um, uh, a, a former workshop mate, co-worker of mine, um, Andy Chambers had gone over to Blizzard and he was he was there as the creative director on StarCraft 2. And I said, oh, I've always liked Blizzard games and I'm kind of at a point now in my career that may be a big move to foreign parts. I don't know. What do you think? And he spoke to the right people. He spoke to people like Sam Didier and Chris Metzen and they went, Gibbons, just get him out. <laughs> so that was that. That was now nearly 18 years ago. <laughs> and you've actually done some work with Andy Chambers on a game of your own that, that you sort of developed together and it called uh, Dark Deeds, right? Which was oh, yeah. a kind of card game. And what was the sort of process and the journey like for creating that together? Well, yeah. So, I, uh, um, so fast forward through my seven years at Blizzard and a couple of years at Riot. And I and I left to um, again just to try freelance again. I'd, I'd, I'd had my fill of big studios at, at that point, so I was kicking around here, thinking, okay, what am I gonna what am I gonna do? What am I gonna start working on? And then I just got a call from Andy saying, "I've done a card game, I need an artist." I said, "Well, tell me more." So it's called Dark Deeds. I said, "That's that's all I needed to hear." When did we start? <laughs> um, so it was a, a crazy sort of four months. They're doing all the art for that. Um, and we we released it to a, a little independent publisher um, who had never done a game before, and we got really carried away with it. We got really indulgent with the components. We had wood tokens and a metal coin and a little burlap sack that you put it all in, and it ended up being really, really nice but really expensive. Um, so we, we did a little print run, and we sold them all, and that was it. Um, but I always wanted to return to it. I thought I always thought it could have been a bigger, bigger game. I thought I wanted, I like all artists, I wanted to noodle on the art and do some new cards and tweak some bits. And but Andy um, and Ryan Miller, who was our, our, the writer on that, they like sensible game developers had moved on. They had half a dozen <laughs> other projects to go. I was still noodling away on Dark Deeds. I still wanted it to be more, to be bigger. I think it should have deserved to be a hit. <laughs> and they were like, "Yeah, but fine, fine. I'm off doing Judge Dread and stuff." So, like, you know. Um, and then, and then COVID came along and I, I needed a, another project. So I decided I was going to make a new version of Dark Deeds for online play. So there was a, a, a an online platform called, called Tabletopia, which, um, uh, little, pu which publishers tend to use, um, to promote the physical versions of the game. So if you, if you don't know whether you want to buy this game yet, we can go play it for, for free on Tabletopia. Uh, I thought well, that would be a good format for me to sort of get what I think is the definitive version of the game made. And who knows who might see that. So I spent the COVID summer uh, making that. And, um, yeah, lo and behold, uh, Chris Birch, who is the head of Modifius, who are an independent UK publisher, um, played it with me and said, oh, we'd like to, um, we'd like to do a new edition of that. And, um, uh, and, then, and then we have, we have this. Now, which is the uh, uh, prototype uh, test uh, print of the new physical edition of the game, which is at the printers, hopefully, um, <laughs> and due for release in the spring. Fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, again, it's just me not, not, um, not being prepared to move on from anything. <laughs> noodling away, noodling away, changing the art, tweaking the rules, improving this and that. So we're publishing that with uh, uh, with in partnership with Modifius, but 
also with the studio I'm now uh, an art director at called uh, Rookery Publications, which is a studio I set up along with some other former Games Workshop uh, staffers um, uh, based in Edinburgh, uh, Andy Law, Lindsay Law, Andy Leesk. Um, and to do, again, back to tabletop, uh, doing um, our own line of role-playing games. But when when the uh, chance to revisit Dark Deeds came along, I said to my my teammates, why don't we kind of, because I knew that Andy Law in particular would be uh, an amazing help in, in uh, tweaking the development and tweaking the rules and making sure it looked beautiful, because he's just one of these amazing all-rounders, you know? So he and I sat down and, and and knocked all the rough edges off what I thought the perfect version of the game was. I went, oh, no, this is the perfect version of the game. So it, that was an absolute treat. Uh, so, yeah, it's new and shiny and and not ridiculously, not ridiculously expensive anymore. <laughs> so hopefully that's going to come out in the spring and um, everybody will love it. And then we can work on the next thing. Um, so, yeah, it's um, uh, back in the tabletop world at last. <laughs> uh, if it felt like a home, I say at last, it's been now three years that we've been doing this, uh, but it felt like a real homecoming. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I, I long may that continue. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you think you would explore the Dark Deeds sort of world in other ways, in other games, potentially down the line? Well, yeah, back in the day, um, Andy Chambers and, and myself uh, had a, 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 a next game in the series sort of sketched out, which is called Dark Deities. They all have to be dark games, <laughs> um, uh, but it, it was it, we, and I'd done all as always. I'd done all the art for it, but the rules <laughs> uh, were, were in progress. So I was up in Edinburgh um, the year before last, and I took I took my prototype up there to sit down with Andy Law and play through it. And of course, Andy had a ton of ideas. So depending on how well Dark Deeds is, I'm not sure I should be talking about this, but depending on how well Dark Deeds is received, we will definitely be working, moving on to Dark Deities. But between those two games, we have The Coiled Crown, which is our uh, RPG uh, world, which we put up, we've done a couple of PDFs that we put out on drive-through to sort of test the, the, the waters, and they went, they went down really well. So we're close to finishing our first big adventure book, for the coil of the crown, which is called Ship of Fools, um, I don't, I don't know yet what format that's going to take and when that's going to come out. But again, we are again talking with publishers about it. We might be a Kickstarter, and we might put it out just in, um, um, as a standalone or as part of something bigger. Mm. We don't know. We haven't decided. Um, but we're going to be talking about that in the coming months. But it's all very exciting. It certainly sounds it, yeah. I mean, so is the, the rookery would you, you sort of describe it as a, as a kind of co like a, a design collective, looking at different things and sort of creating things together. Is that how it works? Uh, yes, I mean, initially it was it, we were very focused on oh, we're going to do uh, this art, big RPG, big fantasy RPG line, um, uh, because that was that was uh, uh, the background of every because the, the other my teammates all came from Wolfrop. Um, so that was a that seemed to be the natural thing. But then when I came along with, with Dark Deed, they said, Oh, we could do all sorts of games, couldn't we? Yeah, we could. We should do all sorts of games. Um, so that's where we're that's what we feel about, about it now. But um uh um and um yeah, I mean we the, the idea of bringing in other other writers, other uh, certainly other artists, I'm not doing it all myself, um, is is our plan. And we are uh, uh we are the rookery in that we are the that uh, yes, a, a nest of rooks, a parliament of rooks, but also a ramshackle collection of dilapidated Victorians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the other interpretation of rookery. So yeah, a collective is a, it would be a good way to describe it. That's great. Yeah, and you've also done more art for the Warhammer world through Cubicle Seven's Wolfrop as well, haven't you? In more recent times. Well, that's how I met Andy Law. Yeah, because he was right. commissioning art at the time, and I, I did, I did a, I only did like half a dozen pieces for um. Uh, 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 rough nights and hard days, um, but we really hit it off. So when Andy Law um, uh, left Cubicle Seven uh, and was setting up his own company, and he, he approached me, and said, "Oh, would you be interested in, in doing some commissions?" And I said, "No, no, you don't. What you don't want to commission an, an artist. What you want to do is you want to you want to get an artist involved in the company." 
you know, we want to find an artist to partner with. And I went away. And then he came back to me a week later and said, would you like to be that artist? I said, well, <laughs> funny you did ask. <laughs> yes, that's how, that, that's how that all started off. Yeah. So again, he was just somebody that I really hit it off and I could really see right from the get go, a kindred spirit, you know, mm. uh, and he can turn his hand to so many things i mean he's an artist he's an award-winning cartographer himself you know so um i knew that he would and and he's a perfectionist like me too which is often a curse but at least i have a sympathetic ear when i say <laughs> i'm just gonna i just need to noodle on that on that piece of art a bit more and he goes i just need to change the spelling or i need to you know re rephrase that paragraph in the text you know we were okay we we're okay with each other doing that yeah I mean, so it sounds like there's quite a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon then for for you and for for the rookery and and sort of beyond even the dark deeds and and whatever happens with that space. There's lots of other cool stuff in the mix. It sounds like, yeah, very much. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's 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 always a bit of a challenge to set up your own company. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Um, but it's been uh, it's been really satisfying and really rewarding. If if uh, uh a bit of a, a bit of a struggle and a bit of a headache at times but that's you know that's that's what happens when you take on um uh, uh responsibilities like this when you're not you're no longer um an employee or even it's a freelancer you oh no we're gonna we're gonna run our own studio now like oh this is why people don't do this <laughs> <laughs> uh but it's yeah it's it's i wouldn't i have choice i wouldn't do anything else because it's just it gives you that that um that ownership, you know, of, of of your of your work and the worlds you build, and it's kind of you realize that that um, as I certainly as I've gotten older, I've realized the the how how important it is to me to to feel like I I you know what I do is not mine exclusively, but that I I it there's a there's a sense of my babies, uh, you know, raising my my children rather than give, giving them up for adoption. Um, <laughs> sure. That's not a metaphor. <laughs> sure, no, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I suppose looking back now on that career you had uh, in Games Workshop, you know, sort of and, and visiting the the sort of worlds of of GW a couple of times in in many different ways and through different companies as well. Do you have any sort of reflections on on the sort of entirety of that, the totality of that experience working on Warhammer and 40k and everything else? Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Deeply grateful for the for the opportunity. I don't I don't think I mean can, when you consider what a what a colossal uh, a juggernaut of of uh, um, just a colossal creative juggernaut it, it is these days. It's amazing to think that you know you got to have a hand in in shaping any of that back back in the day. You know when you see the enormous audience it has, when you see how successful the video video games of uh, of uh, Warhammer have been, when you hear that Henry Cavill's making a movie slash tv shows with amazon based on it you go well, wow okay yeah that was a that was pretty big you know <laughs> you know yeah i don't think it's it's rare that you that you get to uh appreciate that at the time it's inevitably something that comes further down the line unless you know unless they hire me to do some stuff on with henry cavill that'd be nice <laughs> um i would yeah I'd, find, I'd make the time in my busy schedule to do that <laughs> again on that um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's a uh, it, it very sort of feel very privileged to have uh, to have been a part of that in uh, at all. Yeah, it's been um, a great honor. Yeah, I mean, is there any? Mine, uh, sorry, there's a friend of mine that um, uh, uh, somebody mate of mine who is uh, um, always looking to do new to do new work, um, um, but he's always get, gets asked about his most iconic creations from the past, and. Um, I, I understand that too because I'm all you know I'm always doing new stuff but always, I always get asked about work that I used to do but it's kind of like when you think so many artists so many creative people never get asked about the things that they've made you know I I still I'm I'm always happy to chat about orcs and goblins <laughs> <laughs> sure. well yeah to, to to maybe finish by asking you about work that you used to do <laughs> and you've sort of alluded to, to a few pieces, but is there any sort of single piece that you sort of remember most fondly or sort of look back on as, as sort of most proud uh, piece of work? Um, it, there's, there's not that, there's not that many because I don't, um, I don't, I don't want to say I don't like my art, but like a lot of artists, I, I don't find it 
that pleasurable to look at it because all I look at, all I see is the things that I could have done better. But there's a few pieces. As I said, I've got pieces based on Jez Goodwin's miniatures or, or concepts, and I, and some of those are all right. You know, I've got I've got a Eldar, a, a, a swooping hawk. Um, uh, a striking scorpion and the avatar of Kane. I've still got those in my collection. I'm loath to part with. Um, uh, I've got a, a, a white from the uh, Undead Army book that I still like very much. Uh, there's one Space Marine piece I've got. Oh no, the um, uh, there's a piece I did. I think you mentioned it in, in one of the, one of your um, podcasts. The uh, Gene Sealer Majors fighting the Grey Knight. Yes. With a, yeah, classic, oh. amazing piece. So, that that's that that has meaning for me for a number of reasons. One, I can I can stand to look at it, but two, it took me three months to finish because I broke my arm. When I broke my arm, I was in the middle of doing that piece back in like ninety one. So um, uh, it, it, there's history uh, beyond the art that um, uh, is pivotal in that. When I started that piece, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an artist, but at the time I finished that piece, I was absolutely convinced that's what i needed to do so that's a piece that for big reasons i, I don't see myself ever buying with no but that's it and it, that's fascinating though yeah to, to for the a single piece of art to bridge that sort of transition in your sort yeah. of outlook and your life that's that's amazing and for it to be such an incredible piece as well i mean i still think the 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 uh the gray knight with his force field he's the only one who survives the the, the major's attack <laughs> Asked me quite recently, what, what's he doing with a spot of blood angels? And I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> why with blood angels? I, no, I can't. No, just I, <laughs> I, I, I don't look. I, I guess because I, I've done a lot of Deathwing, and I wanted to paint somebody or draw something other than Deathwing. So I, I, went, I went with blood angels. Like I know <laughs> no more reasoning than that. I don't think. <laughs> Perhaps it was a desperate last stand in in some way and it was just whoever was around could step in but i think those are the kind of fun stories that come from that that sort of art as well yeah 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 yeah. i don't i don't remember if that was a commission or, or again it was another one of those pieces that i just did um off my own bat at the time i think so i don't think anyone was said can you you know because the, the unusual uh nature of the piece i don't think i don't think games workshop would have said can you do a gene stealer Killing a load of Terminators. I don't think that would have. Been, I think that was quite on message at the time. <laughs> well, you need a you need a few examples of that to to br- really yeah. bring the sort of terror of the yeah. world to Perilous, life. I think Perilous, uh, uh, the forty first millennium for sure. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I think that that that's a terrific sort of place for us to to wrap up, Mark. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me and sort of tell me <laughs> some of your fantastic stories. So thank you very it's, much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, John. Lots of fun. And the, and uh, uh, Martha as well. Did you, Martha? <laughs> yeah, she she's <laughs> definitely <laughs> made her presence known at multiple points. I think. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for joining me to talk about your career and experience. It was a real pleasure. If you want to check out more of Mark's work, I have included a link to his portfolio and to his company, The Rookery, where you can find out more information about the recently announced re-release of Dark Deeds. If you want to support the work that I do here on the channel, feel free to check out my Patreon, my Ko-fi, and my Discord. And you can use my Element Games affiliate links whenever you buy hobby supplies, because that helps support me too. You can find all of those links in the description as well. Thank you very much to Mark for joining me. Thank you for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery.